Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. In March of 1812, on the eve of a major war with Great Britain, the United States became embroiled in a military incursion with Spain on its southern doorstep in Spanish East Florida. Called the Patriot War, the Georgia militia assisted local English-speaking Floridians, ergo the Patriots, in laying siege to St. Augustine. They occupied nearby Spanish towns and forts in an attempt to seize East Florida from Spain by force. The U.S. government's special envoy to the Seminole, a retired Georgia governor and militia general, George Matthews, sought to keep them neutral in any conflict that might break out between the Patriots and Spain. This covert and unjustified military occupation of Spanish territory destroyed livestock and countless homesteads. The Patriots claimed to have established a free republic in East Florida. They drafted and approved a constitution and called on the United States to annex her. All that remained for success was for Spain to surrender her garrison at the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine. That surrender never took place. Spain steadfastly held out. The Alachua Seminole ultimately decided to back the Spanish, concluding that while the Spanish would not seek to encroach upon their lands, the Americans, by contrast, likely would sooner or later. Matthew's black interpreter, a slave called Tony Proctor, had escaped his servitude and sought refuge among the Seminole. He confirmed their worst suspicions about the Americans' ultimate designs upon their territory. Soon after, as British-aligned Spain vigorously protested this illegal occupation, the Patriots' Mission Impossible began to falter. With America on the cusp of war with Great Britain and seeking to avoid a two-front conflict, the Madison administration denied any culpability for the so-called Patriots' conduct. It refused to support or recognize the fledgling Patriot Republic of East Florida. Nevertheless, the United States feared Britain might use the port of its Spanish ally at St. Augustine to land an invasion force against Georgia. So Madison, as a deterrent to Britain, dispatched the U.S. Army to occupy captured Spanish East Florida posts in place of the Patriots. Spain stayed neutral. Soon, Patriot military forces began to withdraw and quiet ignominy. Spain's stubborn defense raised the Georgians' ire, but what they really found intolerable was the Spanish use of black troops to defend Florida from outside its St. Augustine military garrison. These forces clashed with the Georgians on September 9, 1812, when a war party of free black militia and black maroon Seminoles dressed as Indians boldly attacked and destroyed the storehouses at the Patriot outpost of Piccolata on the St. John's River. This, despite the presence of 250 Georgia volunteer soldiers. A humiliation like this would simply have to be avenged. To explain how this Patriot War encounter set the stage for an early military showdown between American forces and Seminole Indians, one that would chart the course of U.S. Seminole relations in Florida for the next half century, is James G. Cusick. He is the author of The Other War of 1812, The Patriot War and the American Invasion of Spanish East Florida. Dr. Cusick is the curator of the P.K. Young Library of Florida at the University of Florida, a research associate with the St. Augustine Historical Society, and a former board member and officer of the Seminole Wars Foundation, producer of this podcast. Dr. James Kusick, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Well, thank you, Patrick. I'm very glad to have this chance to talk with you. There are some, myself included, who believe the Seminole Wars began with the Seminole resistance to the renegades seeking to overthrow the Spanish rule of Florida in 1812 in the so-called Patriot War. What's your view on this? The importance of that particular conflict is that it's the first time that a group of the Seminoles goes up against the American military in a conflict. And so in that sense, it's the very beginning of a long military struggle between all the Seminole groups, and ultimately the Miccosukee and the Creek as well, with American forces. 
What was this Patriot War? Well, the Patriot War was the name that was given to what was really an American military occupation of Florida during the War of 1812. And Florida was still under Spanish rule at that time. So the U.S. military stationed in southern Georgia came across the border to support people who were rebelling against Spanish rule in Florida. And this group of rebels were known as the Patriots. But it turned out later on that about 75% of these Patriots were actually Georgians who had been recruited on the American side of the border to come across and start a revolt. So you wrote a book on it, The Other War of 1812. Why did you write it? I became interested in the topic because there was already a good book about this whole conflict out. Rembert Patrick's book called Florida Fiasco, published in 1954. I read Patrick's work several times. I really liked it. But as I was going through it, I noticed that most of the story in his book was told based on American military records and on newspaper accounts. And I knew that there were a lot of other American sources besides the military sources, and that there were good Spanish sources on the conflict and also some British sources. So I decided to revisit the Patriot War and try and put it more in the context of the broader War of 1812 that was going on at more or less the same time. People know so little about the War of 1812, and then to find out, oh yeah, there was another War of 1812 that you haven't heard about either. How deeply was the U.S. government involved in this other War of 1812? Well, when I started, I thought that the administration of President James Madison was pretty heavily involved because that's what Patrick had concluded. And I followed along with what was written in his book. After I published the book, I heard from a leading Madison scholar, JCEA Stack, who's the editor of the Madison Papers. And he and I became good friends, but he did not agree at all that the Madison administration had sponsored this military occupation. And so he went through all the documentation of the letters that were coming in to the State Department at that time when James Monroe was Secretary of State, what kind of information and letters were going to James Madison. And what he found was that the Madison administration did actually have an agent down on the Georgia-Florida border. Uh, that agent was George Matthews. He was a former governor of the state of Georgia. Uh, and he had instructions to keep an eye on what was going on in Spanish Florida and to alert the administration if there was any evidence of a revolt against Spanish rule or any evidence that the British were becoming involved in Spanish Florida. And so he was constantly writing back to Madison and, and to Monroe about what he was doing on the border. But it turns out that they didn't pay a lot of attention to what he was writing. And in many cases, the letters were not opened until long after they had arrived. And so Matthews, not hearing very much back from the administration, went ahead with plans he had made, which was basically plans to launch a filibuster to start trouble in Spanish Florida, to enlist the help of some plantation owners who were living in Florida, and then to back them up with forces in Georgia. And that's what he did. In March of 1812, he essentially dispatched forces across the border, and they declared a rebellion against the Spanish government, and they seized the town of Fernandina, which is right on the border. And as soon as they did that, Madison had backing from the local commander of the Navy, and the local commander of the infantry, that they would go in and then protect uh, these patriots who were rebelling against the Spanish. But all of that apparently took the Madison administration completely by surprise. They didn't know that Matthews was going to go that far in basically stirring up trouble in Florida. And so they really had to scramble once they found out about it, because there was a huge international and diplomatic furor over it. The British objected, obviously the Spanish objected. And also at this particular time, March of 1812, the Madison administration and, and President 
Madison pretty much knew that an American declaration of war of Britain was coming, and it did come in June. Uh, and so this was not good news for them, that they were suddenly fighting Spanish forces right at the time when they intended to declare war on what was then the superpower of uh, the 19th century, Britain seemed like they would take Florida if they could get it on the cheap and with some deniability, but otherwise didn't want to get into what we talked about in the following century about a two-front war. That was exactly it. They had already grabbed part of what was West Florida, including an uh, area around Mobile. That area actually had revolted against Spanish rule and American forces had intervened and the American government then claimed sovereignty over that area. Uh, and that had happened in 1810. And that was kind of the model for what Matthews wanted to do. The problem was he couldn't get enough people in Florida to revolt, so he had to stage a rebellion. But what ultimately happened was that once the war against Britain started, the Madison administration found itself in a very difficult place. It did not want to have to fight a war against Spanish forces or Spanish and British forces on the southern border. On the other hand, it was afraid, uh, Madison and Monroe were both fearful, that if they pulled American troops out of Florida, Either the Spanish would retaliate or the British would take it as an opportunity to land in Florida and establish a base there. So they instructed American forces to stay there, but simply to stay, to occupy the area, but not engage in hostilities. Very bad situation, obviously, for, any, for the commander and uh, for the uh, troops that were in Florida, because they were in a situation where they were being told, don't attack and engage in hostilities only if you are attacked. And they had no time limit on this. They were just basically told to hold ground there. In a sense, that was successful because the British did not land and then invade Georgia from Florida, and the Spanish did not decide to cross the border and attack into Georgia. Strategically, it probably was a good move because later on when the troops do eventually withdraw, they eventually do have to leave. By late 1813 and 1814, in fact, the British do begin operations in Florida. So to some extent, it did buy time and keep British military activity away from the southern United States for about a year. The occupation lasted from March of 1812 until May of 1813, so it was a little bit longer than a year. Most of our listeners won't know that Britain had a history in controlling Florida as a colony. That's true, and Florida was always a place of contention, and the Spanish hold on it was very weak, and this was the Napoleonic era. I mean, it's important to remember that it was 1812 when Napoleon basically fell from power. But prior to that, the United States in particular didn't know what French ambitions were in North America, and the British always had ambitions in North America. And so that's one of the reasons why the government of the United States kept such a close watch on Florida, which was bigger then. Um, it not only included the peninsula and the panhandle, but all the, the Gulf Coast territory all the way over to the Mississippi River. So at one time, Natchez, Mobile, um, as well as Pensacola were all part of Florida, even though they're now parts of separate states. So yeah, that whole period was really one of watchfulness because there was talk that Spain might cede Florida to France or to Britain, and that would have a lot of repercussions for the United States. Spain had a tenuous hold on it, but it was an important hold because of shipping. Why was Florida important to Spain for shipping? Florida, for the most part, was not that important to Spain as a colony. Spain's concerns were always protection of Mexico, and protection of the Spanish Caribbean, especially Cuba. And so the reason Spain objected very much to the Louisiana Purchase was because Louisiana originally had been the colony that was protecting the borders of Texas, which in turn was protecting the borders of central Mexico. And the reason they held on to Florida or wanted to hold on to Florida was because if another power established itself in Florida, well, even today we know how close Cuba is right? Cuba's our next door neighbor. So Cuba could never be safe with a hostile power in Florida. And so Spain had to hold on to it primarily to keep it as a buffer zone and simply keep people further away from Cuba than they would be if Florida was British or French or American. 
So during this period, the U.S. sent an envoy to the Seminole. What was his mission? Well, the Spanish and the Americans were both sending envoys to the Seminoles. I should explain that at that time, the closest group of Seminole Indians, the closest towns, were in Alachua, what's today Alachua County, where the University of Florida is. And that's about 80 miles inland from St. Augustine and a little bit more than 80 miles south of the border with Georgia. They were the Alachua Seminoles. At that time, led by a headman or, or chief known as Payne or King Payne. So people familiar with Gainesville and Alachua County will know that Payne's Prairie is named after Payne. This was a small group, less than 2,000 people. They traded actively with St. Augustine, and they traded somewhat with American Indian traders in Georgia. Because they were a small group and they were very far away from the Creek Confederacy and even from other major seminal groups, like the groups at Lake Miccosukee, Payne tended to have a policy of neutrality. He really didn't want trouble with anyone because his people were more or less on their own. They couldn't count on a lot of support from the Creeks or from other groups because they were too far out of that sphere where the Creek Confederacy was established. So he tried to, to maintain good terms with everyone. Once this military occupation started, George Matthews, on behalf of American forces, sent envoys to Payne and Governor Sebastian Kindalan, who was the Spanish governor in St. Augustine, also sent envoys to Payne. And the idea was uh, that both sides were soliciting the aid of his warriors to assist them. Matthews actually wanted to promote more neutrality. His message to King Payne was simply, stay out of it. Stay out of it. We won't bother you. You don't bother us. Don't get involved. Governor Kindalon's message was different, obviously. He wanted the Seminole Braves, the warriors, to come in in uh, support of uh, his military forces. The principal envoy that went, interestingly enough, was a slave named Tony Proctor. Tony Proctor had come to Florida as a slave during uh, British rule in Florida around the time of the American Revolution, and he had remained in Florida and he was a slave of the Patton Leslie Indian Trade Company. Like several other black slaves in Florida, he was multilingual. And so uh, besides English and Spanish, he spoke Muscogee, and I believe he spoke other Native American languages as well. He was an interpreter for the Indian Trade Company. Well, the American forces caught him. They captured him, and they learned of his abilities and who he was. And uh, Governor Matthews, George Matthews, decided to send him to the Alachua Seminole with kind of the American ultimatum, which was a rather patronizing one. Um, I, think, I think the message was, you just stay at home and mind your own business and, and we won't trouble you. So that's what happened. Proctor went into Alachua. I think he was accompanied by George Matthews and, of course, by his captors. But what he discovered when he reached Alachua and was talking to the Seminole in their own language was that his American captors couldn't follow him. They didn't have a good enough command of the language to really know what he was saying. And so he gave their message to Payne and Payne's advisors. But interspersed with it, he was telling the Seminole leadership None of this is true. This is all a pack of lies. These men, I've heard them talking to their own troops, and they're promising Indian land to their recruits in return for service. They intend to take your land, right? The parley did not go at all well. <laughs> and, and George Matthews couldn't understand why, and he was a very hot-tempered man, kind of like Andrew Jackson was, and he got very angry, and he began to threaten pain, which only made things worse. And then the kicker to it all was that on the way out of Alachua, Proctor managed to escape from his captors. And he turned around and he went back to Alachua on his own. And he gave them all the messages that he had from Sebastian Kindelon, the Spanish governor, telling them what Kindelon hoped that they would do. And he said, the governor will supply you with guns if you will come in and support him because he's locked behind the walls of St. Augustine and he needs help 
to try and break through the American lines and break through their supply routes in hopes that they will withdraw. So this started a whole debate among the Seminole. Uh, Payne was not in favor of it, but another prominent leader, one of his relatives, kinsman Bolix, was in favor, and a lot of the young warriors were in favor. Uh, they felt if they didn't make a stand that they were going to be facing these American troops anyway, and therefore it was a better choice to make a stand while they had the support of Spanish troops. And ultimately, Payne sent a delegation over to St. Augustine. They met on the outskirts of the city, and they agreed to come in on the Spanish side, not in an all-out campaign, but mostly as hit-and-run raiding parties, where they would try and strike behind the American lines and just upset things, you know, cut supply lines, uh, intercept couriers, and just make things difficult. The American forces in Florida were about a 1,000 men, but they were spread all over the place. Uh, some were right outside St. Augustine, about three miles outside the city. Some were on the St. John's River, some were in Fernandina, some were at the future location of Jacksonville, at the Cow Ford. Uh, they had to defend all these points. I think they had to def defend Fort Picolata as well. Um, so they, you know, they didn't have uh, a concentrated force anywhere, and they had to keep running messengers in between all their different encampments. Uh, to keep in contact. And so the seminal role in all of this was they disrupted everything. They made sure it was no longer safe for contingents of troops, particularly small contingents of troops, to move between the various military installations. Concurrently, the American request of the Seminoles to stay neutral evolved to one of requesting active support of the so-called patriots. How did this affect operations? The Seminoles never um, considered support for the Patriots. I think Proctor's message uh, rang true for them. They didn't trust that group. And in fact, many of their raids were directed at the plantations that were owned by people who were acting on the Patriots' side. And they would hit these plantations, they would uh, take the supplies, they would wreck the plantation work, and then especially significantly, they would um, essentially take all the slaves who were at the plantation, all, all the families, and go back to Alachua with them. So they removed all the enslaved labor. This did two things. One, it increased their population, and it increased the potential they had to get men to support their raiding parties. And it also crippled the plantation economy, especially the plantations of settlers who had decided to go in on the American side and support the occupation. Were these acts a contribution to the Americans saying, we actually should turn these Seminoles and get them to our side? Or was it larger political considerations that had nothing to do with Seminole actions in support of the Spanish? The real reaction of these raids was to create outrage in Georgia. So there was really no talk of trying to win the Seminoles over. All the talk from Governor Mitchell down through the legislature and in the among the editors of the newspapers was retaliation, that they were now facing an Indian war and that therefore the Seminoles, just like the Spanish, were now enemies. They were now a hostile force. So in fact, the, you know, the, the net effect of the raiding was to uh, kind of, drain, on the American side, it was to create support or to, or to incite support in Georgia to send additional militia troops down into Florida to put an end to what the Georgians now saw as uh, a brewing Indian war. What action lit the fuse to seminal participation on the side of the Spanish in a direct fashion? The major circumstances that weighed in with the Seminole were, one, the military occupation was interfering with trade. So the, the hide trade, which they participated in, and the cattle trade and the horse trade, which they were major players in, was all disrupted. That meant that they could not get in things that were necessary to them. When they went hunting, uh, they tended to hunt with firearms at this time. So they, you know, they needed gunpowder and munitions for their firearms. They were used to getting other materials through trade. And so that was putting some economic stress on all the people of Alachua. The bigger concern, I think, though, was that they were convinced or became convinced that while the Spanish had no designs on their lands, the Americans of Georgia did. 
the uh, Spanish footprint in Florida was very small, and it was mostly contained to the coast. And so the Seminoles uh, were highly autonomous under the Spanish. They met with them for parleys and treaties, but essentially most of the land that was west of the banks of the St. John's River was pretty much acknowledged to be Indian territory. I think Payne and particularly Bolex realized that if there was a change of government in Florida and Florida was ruled primarily by people out of the American South and principally by people from Georgia, that they were going to be facing the same situation that their ancestors had faced in Georgia, which was that they were going to start to be pushed off their lands or lose their lands. Kind of a choice of, you know, making a stand to try and prevent the future loss of their territory. What part did Black Seminole play in this decision? Well, I should say that uh, when you look at the documents of the time, you never see any reference to anyone called the Black Seminole. In American documents, if they talk about blacks among the Seminoles, um, they refer to them as the Negroes or the runaway slaves or the Maroons. And in the terminology that you see in the Spanish colonial papers, it's more or less the same. They, you know, they frequently refer to them as, you know, los negros, or the, the blacks who live among the Indians. So it was a group that came from, from kind of different circumstances. And there were some black slaves, uh, enslaved blacks among the Seminoles. The Seminoles did own slaves. Uh, pain owned slaves. And so, uh, a, you know, a portion of that population were people that were held in bondage to the extent that they had masters, just like they did in Spanish Florida and just like they did in Georgia. Others were runaways. Sometimes they were runaways from the plantations in Florida. Sometimes, a lot of times they were runaways from Georgia who had gone into Indian territory because that was the safest place to go to avoid being uh, hunted down by slave catchers. Some were people that the Seminoles themselves released, like when they raided these plantations. It wasn't a homogenous group. It wasn't like everybody was had the, had the same status or the same identity in Seminole society. But the blacks living among the Seminoles had all sorts of different roles in Seminole society. Uh, they were interpreters, just like Tony Proctor had been an interpreter. They sometimes farmed land or took care of cattle herds. Some lived in their own hamlets their own, you know, kind of small villages or small towns that were adjacent to the Indian towns. I think those that served as interpreters that are, or that actually were slaves of a, a leading Seminole probably lived, you know, closer to that kin group. And they also served a military capacity. They would go out, the men at least, would go out as part of the raiding parties, as part of the warriors. And if they distinguished themselves in military actions in, in among war parties, then their status went up. It, it changed their status within the tribe. So they were kind of, uh, in some cases, a subordinate group, in some cases, an auxiliary to the Seminole tribe in Alachua itself. But there was an event which then the so-called patriots or the Georgians found to be intolerable. And that was a free black militia of St. Augustine and an ambush of an American supply party in September 1812. These black Seminole warriors operated with them. What effect did that have then on starting open operations against the Seminole? Well, that was probably one of the crucial engagements. The occupation had been going on about five months. Inside St. Augustine, things were getting very hard. The capital was running out of food, running low on munitions. Governor Kindelon was writing desperate letters to Cuba saying, if I don't get help soon, I fear I will be forced to surrender. American forces it turned out, were in equally bad shape. The American commander was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Adams Smith in charge of the infantry. His men were sick. They were running out of food. They were low on ammunition. Uh, their supply lines were very long, ran all the way from St. Augustine all the way back up into southern Georgia. And so what happened was that some supplies for the Americans arrived on the St. John's River, and Smith sent a contingent of men with two wagons west to the river to get the supplies. One of the groups that was the principal force 
kind of kind of scouting or dragoon force for the Spanish was the free black militia. These were all free men of color, uh, landowners who lived in Florida. They had their own militia company, about 40 men, and they were out on active patrol a lot. And they got word that this party was going to, this wagon party was going to head west. So they took their own company along with some of the black maroon warriors or fighters from the Seminoles and they got ahead of the wagon train and lay an ambush for it. And they ambushed the wagon train, they pinned them down, they severely wounded the lead officer who was a Marine, and they burned one of the wagons, they, they took the other wagon, they either killed or seized the horses and left the area, but they left this group kind of stranded halfway to the St. John's River with a number of casualties and wounded. It wasn't a big party, this wagon train, between 20 and 30 men. But when word of this leaked out, the American commander, Thomas Adam Smith, realized that his supply lines were no longer secure. You know, he, he realized that he now was, he, he had now lost contact with the supply depot on the St. John's River, and he wasn't going to be able to reach it without being attacked. And so uh, he sent news to uh, Daniel Noonan, who was in charge of the Georgia Volunteers, to come in, basically, to his encampment north of St. Augustine to rescue him. And then he pulled up all of his men and went back in force and retreated to the St. John's River, where they were more secure. And that lifted the siege of St. Augustine. That was for Governor Kindelon in St. Augustine, that was like salvation, because all of a sudden he didn't have a force at his gates. People were able to leave the city. They were able to get foodstuffs in, kind of gave him his second win to be able to avoid a surrender. So it was a very big event in terms of this whole military occupation. But, of course, it called for immediate retaliation from the American side. And Daniel Noonan, who was former adjutant general in Georgia, in particular, uh, wanted to make a, dis a direct strike against the Seminole of Alachua. Now, why he was directing his anger at the Seminole is a little unclear. It was the perception of the American troops that it was the Seminole who had sprung that ambush. And one reason for that is because both the Black Maroons and the Free Militia, the Free Black Militia from St. Augustine, had dressed themselves up in war paint and war garb when they made the attack. So in fact, it was not actually Seminole warriors who had sprung that attack, but Noonan blamed the Seminoles, not only for that, but for all the other raiding they were doing. They became his target. He decided they needed to mount a strike directly against Payne and Bolex and their principal town in Alachua. That was a direct consequence. I mean, he began preparations for that in late September, just like a week to 10 days after, the, after this ambush had been sprung. The Seminoles had choices in this Patriot War. Which ones could have led to a better long-term outcome for them if there were any such choices? Well, they did have choices, but their choices were very limited, and they didn't have good choices. I mentioned before that the Alachua Seminole were not a big group. If you want to look at it in military terms, they could put up to 250 warriors in the field. But that was a relatively small force on its own. And as I said, they didn't have a lot of allies. They couldn't count on other Native American powers coming to their aid. And that left them really only the Spanish as potential allies in times of threat. So they went through this debate, right? Payne was reluctant to commit himself to any kind of military engagement at this time. Bolex and other warriors felt differently. But the only good solution uh, for them would have been for Florida to remain under Spanish rule. As long as it was under Spanish rule, that would prevent American encroachment onto their lands. The Spanish did not pose any particular threat or difficulty to the Seminole because they were, the Spanish colonial settlers were a small population and they were primarily interested in lands along the St. John's River and other river systems. They weren't really moving west. So as I said before, you know, that meant that for the Alachua, they could live in central Florida in, uh, you know, vast area of good cattle land, good horse breeding land, excellent hunting ground, good agricultural land, and they could live autonomously. They could, they could be in charge of their own destiny. And it was really, I think, their, their desire just to see that continue. 
the problem was that the circumstances in North America just weren't going in that direction. Spain's days for controlling Florida were becoming more and more limited. Uh, it was becoming apparent over time that Spain didn't have a strong interest in holding on to Florida. Uh, it didn't want to expend the resources to try and hold on to Florida. There was, of course, intense American interest in gaining Florida, and no other power really seemed like it was. France was no longer a player in North America, and the British also didn't have much interest in gaining Florida as a colony. So the problem was that this very small group of, of Seminoles in Alachua were, you know, trying to hold back the floodgates of an eventual American uh, takeover of that area. And it really wasn't possible for a population of 2,000 people to do that, and particularly not a population which was you know, living in well-established towns with a lot of prosperity in horses and cattle and a good food supply. Their life was very different from what it would be in the 1830s and 1840s when the Seminole, to protect themselves, became highly mobile, moved around a lot and, and withdrew into very well-protected areas, areas that were hard to reach. Alachua was not hard to reach. There were very good trails going into Alachua. There had to be because of the trade routes. And everybody knew where Painstown was. That was going to be a difficult area to defend for a small population because they didn't have sufficient strength to be able to really repel a large-scale attack against their homeland. We're out of time now. I recognize I'm leaving our listeners hanging because Colonel Daniel Noonan is assembling a force to go in and perform a punitive raid on the Seminole. But we'll come back in our next episode to discuss that and the near and long-term effects on the Seminole of the Patriot War. Jim Kusick, thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars. Very glad to have this chance to talk to you about the Patriot War. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep this show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted the Seminole Wars Podcast 2020, all rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden, Roast em, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman, all rights reserved.